Hi there, folks. Welcome back to the podcast. And uh, the guest for this podcast is Dave Sharp again. We recorded the first part of Dave's amazing story and shocking story uh, last week. Uh, we spoke about his early life up until he was 16, where he was in uh, the care uh, home system from just before his first birthday up to his 16th birthday. Um, the, the horrors that he uh, endured as a uh, a child within the care system, and when he came out, how he ended up homeless down in London. So we're going to start on the story from where we left off and having a chat with Dave, and I know most of the stuff that's coming up, this uh, is an amazing story which takes him from the streets uh, to some horrific instance in his life that he managed to get through, to making some massive life choices. He found God became a campaigner, and is still with us today, thankfully, um, because his life could have been so much different. So, Dave, welcome back to the, the podcast. Um, how do you feel the, the action went from part one? Well, it was quite big, wasn't it? 30,000 views. Um, yeah, I'd, uh, I, I, I told you last week I'm, I'm doing a lot of stuff in America, in an American podcast to do with satanic ritual abuse. I was, I was on one Wednesday night. Uh, my story, and, and the story across the world seems to be picking up. Um, mm. And and again, Craig, I, I think we're all saying the same thing, that serious changes are going to happen in, in 2024. Uh, we all believe many, many changes are going to happen. And, and, and I think Scotland's going to be at the centre of that. And hopefully I'm going to be in the centre of that, along with... Um, so many other people who, who want to see changes in our country and want yeah. to see our children put first. Yeah, okay. Well, you know, your story is uh, horrific, but it is also uh, inspirational. And I'm not surprised that it's getting uh, an audience and getting so much feedback. Um, it's it was certainly, to look at the, the way it was received, I don't think I should have been surprised because the story is so multifaceted with you know the, the horrors, but the the survival and and all the things that you've had to go through. So to continue on the story from where we left off, uh, you're down in London. Uh, you'd found out uh, that your brother had passed away in, in Northampton. What age are you about uh, round about this this time, Dave? I was probably early twenties. Um, mm. Thomas died in eighty three. He had serious ulcer issues, um, and yeah, he died in Bedford Prison. His ulcers died. So if I came out at 16 in 76, so yeah, I was early 20s, and mm. uh, that was a massive, serious, serious blow because um, th this was my mentor. This is the guy that taught me everything I knew. This is the guy who um, was my father, my uncle, my brother. You know, he was sort of the only family I had, really. Um, but at the same time, it has to be said, it was a guy that I'd let down because I'd, um, again, from what happened to me in my childhood, affected every single relationship I had. And there was many times where Thomas had tried to bond, where Thomas tried to educate me, where Thomas tried to guide me. And I didn't take any notice. And, and it wasn't till he died, I remember feeling so, so guilty. I remember how... Um, I didn't feel more as much guilty as I did annoyed and upset at the life I'd had that I'd missed out on. That that was very, very important. And I remember my family all came down from Scotland. And um yeah, I couldn't cope. I I couldn't cope with this, if you know. Couldn't and, and everybody said I was I was just a mess. I was I was deep in addiction. I was deep in various mental health issues, personality disorders. Um, I'd been in and out of prison, mainly shoplifting, got in a couple of fights, breach of the peace type things, but that that and that, and that's the scope of my whole criminal life, you know. I, I often ask and I often say, and I've had other people say that with the kind of childhood I had and the life I've had, it's it, how it's a wonder I didn't go on to be some sort of mass killer or something, you know, because we read so much about that, Craig, about these people who want to be these mass murderers and, and nine times out of ten it happened because something happened in their childhood and then something mm -hmm. triggered them in later on in life and again we'll go on to talk about this later on how 
when I ended up going into prison, when I ended up being having false allegations made against me, and how I was terrified, and I was writing to MSPs and visiting psychologists, pleading, pleading for help. And again, it's about what the effects of such a childhood has on people. But during this time, I just survived the best way I could. Is it fair to say that when Thomas passed away, because up until just before your 16th birthday, you, you, you had no knowledge of any family, would Thomas have been the first family member to have passed away that you had any uh, recollection of? No, 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 that, that, that's, no, I remember when I stayed at my dad's, um, again, I told you my family's got a history of um, ulcers, they've also got, yeah. also got a history of lung, lung problems, I had two nephews who died of um, cystic fibrosis, um, so my first funeral was David, David was only five, that was when I came out of the home, and that was kind of traumatic. That was when that I, I would attribute that to my increased drug addiction, because I can very, 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 very me much remember that. It was a horrific experience, and then there was there was some other people died, friends, that in that area. So so death was new to me. Funerals were new to me. Um, mm -hmm. But obviously, Thomas's it was the impact it had on 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 um, who, 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 who on my life because I was now definitely on my own um, yeah. you know everything he taught me from the age of 16 um, I was on fast track and and now it, I, had to, I had to use what skills I had um, I was a social misfit Craig, I was a social outcast you know, uh, I couldn't fit in anywhere work was out the question and um, drugs and so, see, see you go I, back to your your, your crime, did you enter the world of crime? Was that to feed your habit at the time? Sorry, that was sorry. Did you enter the world of crime to feed your habit? To feed my habit, yeah, yeah. I'm mm. up old ladies. I can put my hand up and say that. I used to, uh, I mean, that happened in Glasgow. When when I was in Glasgow in the 70s, uh, for that short period of time, we, we used to go into town, a gang of us, uh, pickpocketing. So that's how I learned how to pickpock. Not in London, I learned that in Glasgow. Um, uh, and I remember, I, I, I remember it till the, till the day I die. It was one August, August, September, misty, uh, foggy night, um, down in Saracen Street, and an old lady walked by and I grabbed her handbag. And I'll never forget what was in it. It was There was a, a box of um, after eights and a fiver and, and a half bottle of whiskey. And and that lives with me. I, I, that lives with me all my life. That was something I did, that um, only through the forgiveness of God, that uh, I learned to live with it. But it sits with me, and, and I keep it with me. Yeah, um, it's not the worst thing I did. It's not the worst yeah. thing I did. So, how long did so this life of crime started when you were sixteen? Then, when you you, you were uh -huh. uh, and, your, and your dad's and. Uh, We'll cover more about Alice, etc. That when we go forward, but I take it that's when your life of crime finished, when you found God and and um, stopped doing that. So, what age would that have been when you you you, you stopped nearly, your life of crime? Nearly forty. That was, ne wow. was nearly forty. So we're we're talking about fourteen years, living. Yeah, yeah. As a criminal. Yeah. Right. So nearly twenty you, years actually. Yeah. So, so you, of course, it is. When you um, spoke to me earlier, we were talking about a horrific scenario that happened uh, early in your life where you had been abused by Brother Ryan. You came out of the room, you'd been threatened with your life. If you spoke to anybody about it, you you know, you'd know go and hide in a cupboard or a bathroom or whatever. And if anybody would find you, they would ask you what, what was up, what you were doing. And because of fear, you started a, a life of lies. And once you start that, you're, you're stuck in that um, for long periods. Perversely enough, though, when you, you're living in this altered universe behind lies, and you, you explained that situation that we might go into when you started working and, you know, what would happen when somebody would start asking you questions about your past, did that actually help you keep the life of crime at arm's length? Because you, you then start living an altered Reality. Sorry, you're asking me what? What? 
because you, because you started life, your life of lies, right? And that that mm -hmm. that came back to your your abuse. Um, your life then becomes a lie. You're you're an act, right? Did that help you? I mean, I mean, I think any normal person would consider mugging an old lady for a you know a box of after eights and um, a half bottle of whiskey and a fiver. You know, the, the conscience would, would would bother you. But were you able to deal with that because you just lied your life anyway that you, you maybe didn't did sink in as it would be with somebody who hadn't had the, the trauma that you had previously? Well, we, when you talk about an inferiority complex, that, that puts you at the bottom of the, in the, in the rudder. But when you, when you talk about fitting in, you know, when you talk about bonding and growing up in, in a family environment, that, 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 that you learn being around other people, truth from wrong, right from wrong. And truth from lies, but when when you're brought up in an environment where you you you've got no other option but to lie, you know when I used to when I used to come out of being abused and Ryan would threaten me or even other the other men, and you, you would go and hide in the cupboard or you would hide in the toilets, and you know blood everywhere, and and someone if another especially if a teacher came in or another priest, uh, what are you doing here? What's happened? And you had to make something up. You had to. You had to think of something very, very quick. Now, th there were times when, and this happened quite often, where whoever came in would take sympathy and take pity on you, mm -hmm. and 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 you 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 would grow akin to that. You would like that, and you would find ways of um, adjusting your, your thinking so that you could get sympathy, so that you could get attention, so that you could divert away from the pain. So the, the, the more expert you got at that, Craig, the less painful the abuse was. So as you're yeah. learning to live in this life of abuse and torture, you, you've got this, uh, the, what do they call it now? It's not a mechanism, it's a, a something barrier. There's a word for it, a, a, a safety barrier, that, that you, you're prepared for what's going to happen. You, you know what's going to happen. So you, you learn how to deal with it. And these are one of the defensive mechanisms that, that you actually build. And, yeah. and when I left the care system, again, remembering that I've had my life threatened if I ever, ever tell anybody about the murder of my best friend, which we're yeah. going to come on to soon, I've got to avoid anybody getting close to me. So lying, and we know the story that they're saying that nobody likes a liar. Lying almost becomes a way of living, and and it's very very easy nowadays. I've, I've I've done it throughout my life where I've come across people, and it's very very easy, very quick, to to to, to pick up on somebody who's suffered typical or, or similar abuse. Mm -hmm. And this is why I, this is why I get so upset with this. Um, and it's a term I use a lot, and I'm going to use it a lot because it just when, when people say they're trauma informed, and and you you listen to them and, and they haven't got a clue. It's one of the it's one of the, I think they should ban that term altogether. You know, you can't wear the badge unless you've done the course, you know, you know, unless you understood. It's something I'm really, really passionate about. I don't like to use, I'm very, always very careful with my language, but if I say detest, I, I really mean it. I, I detest that word and the effect it has on people by people who claim to be trauma-informed because it's not difficult. When I, when I spoke to you about when I was in, uh, when I was being fostered out or adopted, we, 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 we know I was adopted from the home, which wasn't adopted, but we know that that's what they'd planned. But but we know that when I was in these places, I was stealing and I was lying. Now, now it's kind of obvious to me that it was a cry for help. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. It's kind of obvious to me now. And, and and I don't mean to be I don't mean to hurt people when I say that. I'm not I'm not trying to be spiteful. And I, a lot of people take it the wrong way, Craig. But when you when it sounds so obvious. And, and people now, the people's views, even to this day of child sex abuse, how they're easier to turn it on us and make us feel the bad people. You know, when so it's obvious, it's a cry for help. I really, really struggle with that. So, so yeah, I've learned all my life how to um, survive. Now I use it. I mean, even now, I, I still have to do it because it's inbred in me. You know, whereas, um, you know, I, I know I, I met a guy once in a church and I, I gave my testimony, and I was talking about this very subject. And the guy came up to me later on, and he was one of the he was one of the elders of the church. And he says to me, "Dave, I've got to share something with you. It's really, really important. I feel it's I feel like God's telling me I need to ask your advice on this." I said, "Go on." He said, "When I was about eight, my mum and dad had a sweet shop, and I, and my dad turned his back, and I stole a I, I stole a 
a toffee or something. And, and, and he says, I don't believe I'm going to heaven. I think I'm going to oh. hell. And this is a guy who was a Christian. And he was an elder in the church. And I thought, well, how sad that, you know, that you couldn't learn how to understand that, you know, it's uh, what we do, how we behave. It, it's, it, it has all these consequences. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly since I became a Christian, I've, I've learned to understand more that um, understanding the way you think, understanding who you are and trying to get that across to other people is very, very important. But again, in Scotland, when you try that, you get slapped, you get knocked down, you get yeah. kicked. Going back to your crime, Dave, I'm going to ask you a question and, I, and, I, and I've got the utmost respect for you. Um, so when I ask you this question, if it's too much for you, just tell me we'll no, move no, on no. to another, right? You made a comment when you were talking about the, the old lady that you snatched the handbag from, and you said that wasn't the worst thing you'd done. How bad mm -hmm. did it get? Every single one. I I used to, one of the worst things I used to do, and I had a little gang, there was, when I, when I mentioned earlier about relationships with women, mm -hmm. um, it wasn't just about sex. I, I had relationships with women who had the exact same backgrounds as me, but they had high drug dependencies. So we became partners in crime. So it was always good to have a woman with you when you were shoplifting. One of the things I used to do, which I'm really, really ashamed of, is I used to go into second-hand shops, you know, like Oxfam and this, where you'd get one or two old ladies and one of us would distract the women while the other went in the back and took their handbags with their pension book. I mean, it breaks my heart now, but these are the sort of things I did for money. You know, do, and it's you, do you feel as if that was a different character then? And you're a different person now. Yeah. This, this, this is what that's I'm trying to say. Able, yeah. this that's is why what you're able to, to talk about it. Yeah, this is why I'm trying to say. Since I became a Christian 25, you know, 28 years ago, whatever it is, that there's two people. Hmm. This is what I'm saying. There's, there's two different people. But, but through forgiveness and through understanding and asking God to forgive me, I, I've learned to deal with it. I've, I've, I've put it in its place. I know, hmm. Craig. I know I'm going to heaven. I've got no doubt about that. I'm a good man mm -hmm. because I follow God's word and mm -hmm. I, 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 I follow God's timing and I firmly believe in God's timing. God, God's, God's timing comes into everything that I do in my life. And we spoke about this before the podcast about 24 being a very, very special year. But mm -hmm. um, your past is your past. You know, sometime if you can't forgive yourself, then you're never going to get no one else is going to forgive you. It's all about your heart, yeah. you know. And you, and I, I spent years and years and years trying to be trying to buy people's friendship, trying to make people get, convince people that I was a good person. And then again, when I became a Christian, I realized: listen, through God's love, God gives you the tools to make you a good person. You have to work on it yourself. And this is what happened when I when I lost Alice. Yeah, so it's probably a good topic to, to go into now. Um, I think it's obvious that because you ended up living a life of lies to protect yourself from the threat of murder, which is quite horrific, and that then became something that you you know you carried on in other aspects of your life. Uh, we, you, you told me before we, we started recording about an instance when, or several instances actually, when you would maybe start a new job or in a new social circle and somebody would be there from Glasgow and um, you were always fearful of that inevitable question, where are you from and what school did you go to? Because then, you know, there might be connections made, there might be then, like, well, what happened there and conversations, so you started telling lies about your past whenever you were in those situations. So I kind of get that and I think, Anybody getting close to you, we've touched on this before as well, you you didn't want those questions asked by anybody. So forming relationships of any kind, whether that be friendship with a male or um, loving relationships with females, they, they, they were sort of off the card for you for long parts of your life. Is that right? Did it what? Sorry, that, what was that last they bit? Were, Sorry. They were off the card. They were not possible oh, for you yeah. for long times. Again, again, predominantly because I was carrying this dark secret. But also because I'd never formed relationships, I'd never be, I'd never bonded with people. I was always mm -hmm. running this life of, um, I, I, I was safer in the darkest places, in the gutter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was safer. That's what I'm saying. When I used to shoplift, um, even in the winter, especially in the winter, when I used to go shoplifting, I, I my objective was to get drugs. But when I got drugs, my objective was to get a roof over my head. Now sometimes I would pay, even in derelict buildings where people took over. 
I would, I would, you know, there'd sort of be four or five or six people. We can't take any more. You know, I'm getting pictures in my head now than Kicklewood and other places in London. And, and also, most of the time, it was Northampton. But um, I, I would pay my way in. And, and you had to have something to buy friendship. You know, mm. you couldn't just walk in because I wasn't a kind of person who uh, mixed easy. I wasn't a funny person. I wasn't a... I wasn't, I, um, I mean, I was dodgy, you know. I, I was everything wrong in the world. I, I injected drugs every day for 20 years, you know. I was a shoplifter. I had no stories of um, a, a happy upbringing, you know. There was nothing There was nothing inviting about me, you mm. know. So you have so to what, buy your way into these places. What changed and what, what allowed you to start a relationship with Alice? Why her? How, why then? How did that... I, I, I've no idea. I, I Alice um, Alice worked in Ladbrokes. Alice didn't do drugs. Alice didn't even smoke. Um, she drank just socially. But um, yeah, I, I met this girl. Um, she was about ten years, twelve years younger than me. Alec was from Port Glasgow, and um, we just became pals. We, we were just mates. And I was on this American podcast just two nights ago, talking talking. The people were asking me about Alice. And uh, we, we just became mates. Alice had this ability to not look back. She had this sort of lifestyle where she looked forward to tomorrow. Tomorrow was going to be great. And 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 I got hooked on this because it made me easier easier for me to forget my past. And uh, um, I, I think yeah, she was. I, I at this point I had a bed sit in bed sit land, and uh, she would come round and stay at mine. There was no sex. We were just friends, and. Um, Something happened. I let my guard down, and and I, I I guess I fell in love. And then one day she took me aside and she says, "I've got something to tell you." I said, "What?" And she was teasing me all day. She said, "Something really important to tell you." I said, "Well, go on, go on then." And because up until that point as well, Craig, what during the very short time that I knew her, and it was only sort of two or three months, and and I, I could feel something happening inside me, and I'd say to her, "Nothing bad better happen to you." That's because bad things have happened to me all my life. And I hope nothing, you know, I'm, I'm, and obviously she didn't understand. I wasn't fully open about my whole childhood or anything like that at that time. Most of it had been locked away in my mind. And uh, she says, I've got something to tell you. I said, well, go on, what is it? And she says, I'm pregnant. And I went, what? And I remember I got on my knees and I'm just, I says, wow, I said, I've not got a family. At that point, when you were talking about my family, I had I had gone up to Scotland quite a few times, Craig, and and but most of my visits with my family were very very short. After after Alice died, um, it became more. I, I was making more attempts to form relationships with my family, but again, it didn't work because I was a drug addict. It was just it was much very difficult for them. But as I say, I did the honourable thing, so I married her. And I married her at Northampton Registry Office on April the twentieth, and uh, I, I was just I I was just a different person. It was just I I was blown away. It was just it was just the most incredible experience. I mean, I'm going to be really honest with you, mate. A really honest confession here. I've not I've not I've, I've done it. I've told you before, but I, I actually went out and shoplifted a wedding dress. Because that's how prepared I was, and that's how much money I had. We didn't have any cakes or, you know, just it was just announced. And, um, yeah, so we got married on April the 20th, and then we went to the pub. So there was no, none of this handing out invites and none, none of that stuff, you know, when you say nonsense, it's not nonsense. It was just, we just did it, and then we went to the pub, and we had a good night there. And and life was great. Life was different. I mean, we, we we would go out. She would finish work, and and then and so, you know, and it was like normal people. We'd go out for a drink, you know, in, in a pub, and I'd go home. And uh, this night we went out, and um, she said, "I'm going to my bed." I said, "Well, I'll make some sandwiches for you for work." So I was in the kitchen making sandwiches, and I went upstairs. This is exactly five weeks later. I went upstairs and and. She was asleep, so I fell asleep and turned the light out. And then in the morning, um, I woke up 
And I have to be careful when I say this because sometimes it can it can trigger people, it can upset people. So, but if we're being really, really honest, this is a really honest podcast that people really need to listen to. You know what happened. You know when I woke up, she she was on top of me, and she felt kind of cold, and and I, I, and she was a bit stiff. I just just didn't something didn't feel right. So I, I rolled her over and I jumped out of bed. The curtains were drawn, so it was pitch black. And I put the light on, and she was lying there. And I describe it like this, Craig. It, 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 she apparently she'd been dead for about seven hours, but um, she was just this stiffness, and it looked to me like her her, bot, her her head had kind of stretched a little bit because she was lying across me. And 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 I ran downstairs. And I ran out the street. I started shouting, and the guy came over, and a neighbour came over, and I said, "Can you can you help me?" I said, "Someone all right." I didn't know she was dead. And I kept on saying, I said, look, she's moving. She said, no, she's not moving, mate. She's dead. I thought, no, 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 it can't be. So the police were called. Doctor came. I was sedated and put back into the hospital. Um, yeah, yeah, she had died. She died in my arms. And um, that was that was the turning point of my life. That was, uh, I remember being in the hospital. And um, what happened was they, they released me from hospital. And the doctor said to me, they said, uh, you, you need you, you you need to seriously think about this because some uh, you, you you've been through things here that not a lot of people have been through. It's going to be really I'll be fine, I'll be, and I was in shock uh, and I went out and, and I started drinking. And it was one of the there's a there's a Scots guy in Northampton who's um, he owned about four pubs at the time. Um, and he, he was a good pal of mine. He was a really good. He, was, he looked after me only because I looked after him. Cause I, he used to buy a lot of my shoplifts and stuff off me. <laughs> He's gone now, but uh, but yeah, he was one of my. Um, I had a little book, plumbers, all all the carpenters, you know, all the tradesmen. That's what I did my shoplift, and that was mainly my brush, uh, paint brushes, drill bits, nail locks, all this. You know, anyway. Um, what happened is he took me aside one day with a load of guys that were Scottish and he had a big bag and he says, listen, we've had a whip run. He said, a lot of people here, we feel what's happened to you. He said, but you can't stay in Northampton, mate. You need to go. You can't stay here because too many memories and, and stuff like that. Uh, and he says, what we've done is, he says, I've gone 25 miles away, 30 miles away. He says, we've um, got you a bed set, a room um, and we've put a deposit then go out there, stay away from Northampton. And uh, so that's what I did. That's what I this? did. And, eh? Where was this? This is a place called Daventry, mm -hmm. which is still in Northamptonshire, but it's just yeah, yeah. away out the way. And I remember I got into the, up in this place and, and um the, but at this point they gave me a new script. So I had a new script. I had to go to see the psychiatrist every week or the psychiatric nurse. I was they, they, they set me up for to, to to deal with this. But what happened is something happened at this point, and this is when all the child abuse resurfaced, Craig. I started getting all these flashbacks and things, and oh my god, it became terrifying. Uh, and then I missed my doctor's appointments. And uh from what I get told, this is what I get told. It was, I don't know if it was the police or someone from the doctor's surgery or somebody, but somebody had came round to the place I was living, and um, on on the ceiling, there was you see that you see that light there, yeah, yeah. the light. Well, there was two. It's a long room, so there was two, and on one, at the whole the whole ceiling had caved in, and on this one there was a rope, so I tried to hang myself. And, and all over the floor, there was uh, vodka bottles and wraps of amphetamine. Mm -hmm. And I'd been using, and was needles everywhere. And, and uh, yeah, they got me. They took me back in again. And uh, they took me in the room. And he's right. He says, you, you've been through so much stuff. He said, you're going to be here for a long, long time. And I remember saying to the doctor, I said, listen, I said, every time I come in here, I said, how many times do you just keep, sticking like gactyl up my backside and give me all these drugs and I said I'm I'm, I'm finished I, I, I'm, I, I can see in my head what's happened now and they were saying they said the, the times you come in here we knew you were a child of your survivor but you never spoke about it you, you come in here in a 10 day dry you, you've had that many overdoses 
Yes, I said at one time, as I told you before, I, I knew all the nurses down at the A and E because I'd done an overdose, and, and and to this day I don't know which ones were a t t suicide attempts uh, or which ones were a cry for help. Mo most people don't when you, when you do it that many times. But I said, listen, can, can we not stop talking about this? There must be, I can't live like this on drugs for the rest of my life. Please help me. So that's when um, I went back to my room and uh, this is the time when, uh, and, the, and I remember them saying to me, said, you're going to be here for a long time. And you, you've, you, you know, it's been, you've gone through a lot. And I, I remember getting back to my room and, and uh, I, I got to my knees and I, and I started to pray. And I says to because I'd never prayed in my life for obvious reasons, because every time I seen a priest, a priest I wanted to hit him or run a mile, yeah. you know, and uh, anybody in authority, really. And I, and I prayed to God. I said, listen, if you really do exist, I said, I could do with your help here. Yeah. I really, really could do with your help. And I fell asleep. And something happened during the night, Craig. Something happened to me. And, and I heard a voice saying, if you do things my way, I'll give you everything you ever need. Not want, but need. You stop the drugs, the crime, turn your life around, and I promise you, and this is what he said, I promise you, I'll get you to heaven and you'll spend eternity with your wife and your child and your mother. And I said something like, you've got a deal. You've got a deal. So when I woke up in the morning, I woke up in the morning and my eyes are shut, but all of a sudden, all I can see in my head is like a clear blue sky. There's no distress. There's no alarm bells. There's no... Uh, uh, depression, there's nothing. And then I thought, hang on a minute, I can breathe. Wow, hang on a minute. Why is my stomach not, because I've had stomach ulcers all my life. What, what's, you know, I've been, I've been through the whole Zantac and the whole, you know, bottles of this and bottles of that. And all of a sudden, and I got out of bed and I went to the window to have a fag. And I went, and I, I ah, didn't like it. I threw it away and I never touched another fag since. And then I went outside because in the grounds, I'd sneaked in a bottle of vodka. We all, we all did it. Uh, we, we, you know, the, the 10 days, the, the 10 days are the ones, the alcoholics are drying out. They go in there for 10 days. I'd, I'd got one of them and, I, I, and I'd sneaked a bottle in and, and I had it in the garden. And I went out and I picked it up, I found it and I went like that and I thought, oh. I'm not going to say I never drink again because that's a lie. I, I didn't drink for years and years and years, but now I can drink socially. And then I walked out and I, and I bumped into this guy, one of the doctors, and, and I told him what had happened. And he says to me, oh, you've been born again. And I says to him, what, does that mean I get my brew money? <laughs> <laughs> I've got two days, I didn't some know. off. <laughs> I didn't know. I had no idea. And he laughed. He says, no noise. He says, no, he says, but see, from this day on, your life's going to change. Oh. There's something very special happened here. Your your life's going to change. And from that moment on, Craig, I couldn't tell. Whereas the day before, I wasn't allowed to go near anybody else. They were trying to keep me awake because I wanted to kill everybody and I wanted to kill myself. I was this. I thought, you know, I, I honestly thought that centuries ago, our ancestors must have up, upset the gods because there was so much tragedy in my life that they, they can't, they, they, this can't be happening. This this is just, you know, I, I don't want to be around this. And now all of a sudden, I've got this mad urge to help people. Do you want a cup of tea? Do you want a biscuit? I did, and, and thankfully, that's never left me. And I can honestly look you in the eye and say now, from that day on, I never touched another illegal drug. I never, I never shoplifted. I never, as far as I know, I never committed a crime. And, and that's very, very important when we go on to talk about the false allegations. It's very, yeah. very important. These are the things I wanted to talk about in a court of law, but I never got the chance. Mm -hmm. Right, so just to take you back a wee bit, Dave, um, you get married on the 20th of April. Unfortunately, Alice passed away five weeks later, so that would have been towards the end of May. When did you first start your relationship with her? Two months before she was pregnant, just a couple of months. So that would have been run about the end of the January. So maybe. Yeah, it was very brief. It was very, very brief, yeah. 
so that, that this relationship from inception to unfortunately her passing away, you're talking about four months. February, March, April, May, four months. Uh, that 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 is like a lifetime crammed in to sixteen weeks. Because you know, you've had a relationship, you fell in love, got married, she was pregnant, and then passed away. So that's a journey that normal people might make in their early twenties, say, when they, you know, they meet someone that they, they end up marrying that could last fifty years. And, and, and that's, that's just incredible that you, you know this managed to be condensed into a 16 week window of your life and fortunately I mean at, at that point you spoke about it to me earlier I mean you, your life could have went in one or two directions at that point um, you could have went I mean you're, I think it's fair to say without right sound derogatory in any way but your life was off the rails right you, you know the addiction but see during that 16 weeks you were with a, a, a lady that um, had a job you know sort of 95 existence during that time, were you out shoplifting, taking the drugs? Did your life change at all during that six weeks, when sixteen week uh, window? Well, uh, no, no, because she became the drug. I, I was still doing drugs. I still had to take drugs. I still, um, I, I still went into um, into the bathroom to fix up. I wouldn't fix up in front of Alice or anything like that. I wouldn't yeah. sit and smoke dope in front of Alice. Um, yeah. uh, uh, but as I say, we only stayed together for that short period of time. But by then. Uh, I knew even before that, I, I, I was coming to a period, Craig, where I was burning out, that there was no doubt about it. I remember being in situations where I'd be sitting smoking, um, maybe taking some pills or something, um, and, and I could end up in a field in the middle of nowhere, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and I didn't quite understand what was happening. And th this was, and spoke about this with the psychiatrist later, this was my body burning out where I would, I would take less drugs but even be more out of it. And yeah. it happens to most people, it happens to a lot of people when you're, um, when you're consuming such heavy drugs, but also, again, when you marry that up with the trauma you're carrying. And, 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 the, and the whole thing here is, that the, the, the amount of trauma that I was carrying at that time, you know, and still do to this day, but for that short period of time, to, it was a very, very powerful experience being with somebody for the first time, being in such a loving and, and safe, what I thought when she was pregnant, I thought this is it, you know, um, this is this is a whole new experience, and and I allowed all my barriers to come down for that short period of time. So um, whereas before, a, a lot of the addiction, you know, how many how many addicts do you know who say if I did if I could only deal with my child sex abuse, I'd be able to handle the drug addiction better. I hear it every day. You know, that's why we talk about abstinence versus harm reduction and all this, which is an altogether other, other different subject, but it's very, very prevalent in Scotland because nobody talks about it. Yeah. So, so you, your life, <clears throat> and I've, 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 I've unfortunately, fortunately not myself personally, but I have had um, people close to me with addiction problems and, and some of them have not made it. And I learned that to try and help because, I, again, I had this urge to help someone that was close to me that was in an addiction and I try to force help upon them. But the specialist said, unfortunately, although you're doing what you feel is the right thing, it will never work because the addict has to be the one that accepts help. And normally, the advice given to me was they have to hit their rock bottom before they have any chance of, of um, recovery. And, you know, yeah, see, I disagree with you there, Craig. Okay. I, by the way, do you know, do you know the, the, the meeting thing's still on at the bottom of the screen? It is on my screen. What does it I've say? Still got the, I've still got the thing saying this meeting has been recorded. Yeah, it has been recorded. Aye, I'll find. I, I'm saying, Aye. I thought you took it down in the first the first part. But what I'm saying is I, I disagree with you in the sense that most people go down to rock bottom because they've run out of people to talk to. People, you know, all these people that go through the revolving doors of prison, in and out of prison, this is a this is a process, and I, when I was in prison, I spoke to them about this. I spoke to the mental health team about this. The criminal justice system, lawyers, a lot of these people who claim to be drug advocates, 
they, they never ever talk about the underlying issues. So what happens is, and you can do it now, we, we, we're trying to fight for this, to get a system in place where we know now, if you go to these people who have been in, in and out of prison and ask, ask three simple questions, how many times have you been in prison? Were, were you in the care system? Were you sexually abused? And did your lawyer know? And, and what point, how quickly did it become apparent to you that you weren't, weren't going to get anywhere even talking about your child sex abuse? So I disagree with you. The, 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 the problem is now that we are unable to, and he, let me put it another way. And again, I, I, I'm going to be talking a lot about this in the near future because we are fed up. A lot of survivors and the drug addicts are fed up with these so-called drug advocates that are running about Scotland now, jumping on each every platform they can, talking about the drug deaths, about abstinence and harm reduction, but none of them, none of them will dare talk about the, the, the underlying issues. And again, we've not got the time now, but if you're going to put a drug addict who was a, who's a survivor of child sex abuse, who spends his whole life looking for that one place where he can feel safe enough to open up those wounds and deal with the underlying issues, if you're going to put that person through a harm reduction room and send him out the other, other end without any hope of, of any light at the end of the tunnel, I'm being very, very serious, can careful with my words, and I've said this before, you, you, you was well put through the gas chamber. Because a lot will give up. You have to make yeah. sure that we have we have we have give these people every option to deal with the underlying issues. And I'm mm. I'm actually been I've actually been blocked, blocked and cancelled by people, drug advocates, for talking about this. And here's the worst thing about it, Craig. Nine times out of ten, when you talk to these people, they say, "Oh, by the way, I haven't learned I haven't learned to deal with my own, my own issues. I was abused as well." And they were not we're not replying with. Well, don't you think you're closing more doors than you're opening? How dare you? I get attacked for speaking the truth. So, the point <laughs> I was trying that. to make... How do you make it, that? Yeah, if normal... And I don't think perfect life exists, right? But if, so a normal living is a 10. And being at death's door is a zero, right? I think the numbers might be different, right? But your life before you met Alice was probably about a two or a three, right? You then met Alice and found comfort in a lot of things that you'd never experienced before. And that would have raised up to whatever it were, you know, a six, a seven, or a nine, whatever it doesn't matter, right? Then Alice dies. Your life before was a two out of ten. It's then going to go, got to be south of that. Because the, the, the um the child abuse was still there, the addiction was still there, but now you're having to, to, to deal with we're losing the first person that you ever fell in love with. And you, you should be a father, right? So wherever it started before you met Alice, it's actually now even further down than that. That obviously had a massive effect on your own stability and your mental health because you spoke about what happened thereafter. So is that the worst part of your life at that precise moment when you lost Alice? I'm going to make a statement here that's going to shock you. And and I'm not ashamed to say this. And I've said it before. And and it does sound, I know I know you'll take it in the context it's men, but given my childhood, mm -hmm. Alice's death soon became coincidental to everything of right. the whole picture. That that's the truth. And it, it, it doesn't hurt me to say that because I'm trying to be truthful and, and the amount of therapy I've had. It's, it all goes back to my childhood, the, the satanic ritual abuses, the, the the isolation, you know, the beatings and all the rest of it. And 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 in the in the whole spectre of my life to date, uh, yeah, I mean, my God, it was a terrible, terrible time. Of course it was. But um, in my whole life, you know, when you start talking about, uh, when you start talking about lost opportunities, when you start talking about what I could have been, when you start talking about um, you know, uh, uh, what my lived experience could, but the, the, the most part of my life which would, would benefit others from my lived experience, it's all my childhood, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, they made, uh, again, I'm not the first person whose wife's died in their arms, pregnant wife's died yeah. in their arms, you know, and, and it was very, 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 very difficult to deal with. But, um, but I, I was already at that stage carrying so much trauma and, and this was just a sort of um, another layer of, of that trauma. And as you know, even more traumas to come later on. 
But yeah, yeah I mean, I, I I do hear you, and 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 people say to me, "My God, the, 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 why are you still alive? What why 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 can you even smile? Why why did you why are you a Christian? Why, why do you even trust another human being?" And and it's hard, yeah. it's hard, but you you've got to uh, you've got to become it, something. Yeah, it's odd that I remember a conversation I had with an ex work colleague who was a very very good friend. We were we became very close. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. And we both had suffered from mental health issues in the past. And I remember saying to him one day when we were at work and he was telling me just more these issues, right? And I said, I genuinely don't know how you survive. And he said, I'll tell you how I survived. He said, see if we get everybody in this workplace in a room and we told them to open up your heart with every problem that you've got and put it on the table. And we went round the room and everybody put every problem they've got on this imaginary table. And then you got to pick whatever you wanted out of all those problems back. You take your own. And his logic was, I can deal with mine. I'm still alive. Horrific as it may be. But that was that was his uh we agree. And then I thought, you know, I, I had my own wee bag of problems, but to me he had a big suitcase of problems. And he says, But Craig, I can cope with mine. Yours are different. Although you may feel they're not as, you know, massive. He says, I'm not sure if I could cope with your bag of problems. And I found that quite bizarre and strange because I had evaluated my bag of problems at that current time has been far less than his. But he had managed to get through them and it was maybe how he coped by accepting whether there was truth in it or not is irrelevant. He grabbed it and said, well, I can cope with my problems. I might not cope with yours, so I'll, you know, I'll, I'll deal with my own. And as I say, I don't know if if the reality is he was on is true, you know, if, it, if he was right. I don't know, but all that was important was he believed that, and he was able to carry on with a, you know a quite a successful job and do it with a certain degree of um, uh, you know he was good at it and mm-hmm. normality. But behind the scenes, he was dealing with trauma that I couldn't have coped with. Um, and you must have been the same because you did survive it. But horrific is all these issues that were flung at you. Of course, you managed to um, deal with them because you're here. By default, exactly. You, you're exactly. Dealt with and, them. and even now, Craig, you know, I've been in my flat nearly twenty years now. Even now, I quite often, more than you, more than you think, I get up during the night and I, um, I, I, I two o'clock, three o'clock, and I walk about crying. I walk about my flat crying. I'm going, this is all mine. That this is this is yours. You know, we, we laughed. I told you before. People, pe- people, people don't understand when I talk about being in love with my coffee table. <laughs> it's unusual, long. you know. And I, I've got a big fifty inch telly, and I, I've got no debt. And 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 I say, God, thank you so much to God be all the glory. And then I say, well, hang on a minute. You take a wee bit of credit yourself, you know. And I think, my yeah. God, what what have you done? But there's also, for me, the faith side, because what, what God does is when I became a Christian, God says, I'm not going to take away all your problems. I'm only going to give you the tools how to deal with them. Mm-hmm. I'm not taking, you're not never going to see Alice or your mother again. I'm only guiding you in a way that you can. It's up to yeah, you, you to do the rest. You need to make that conscious decision to A, believe and B, uh, act. Have, have faith and live in faith. Mm-hmm. And, and, that's what, and that's why I feel so blessed. People say, you know, I don't walk about this happy go lucky guy. I'm no because I'm a loner. I don't trust people. That this world in itself, we all have to be very, very careful, as you know. You know, mm-hmm. um, again, I see it, and I keep saying it. Scotland's different, and that, that, that too many people don't like to talk about or can't talk about this. Now it's gone from that to being too many people now uh, see people like me as a way of making money vulnerable people and, and, and it, it has turned on itself and, and lastly and most importantly Scotland as a nation has turned its back on God we, we know that you know it's um, it, it's it's gone from being God's country to you know God's lost children and, mm-hmm. and it's so so sad when I, mean, yeah, I see that's... these people attack me I think my God you, you, you need God so much in your life that, that you know to, 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 to value money or your own personal development, or your own ver- personal uh, political views that before before your children, that that must be. It, it, it's not. It doesn't make me angry. It makes me sad because 
Yeah. As I say to you as well, Craig, one of the first things I had to do when I came out of the hospital, they said to me, you must go and report this. So I phoned Police Scotland, 1998, I phoned out Fife, and I remember the guy's name, but it's not important, we're not going to talk about mention names, but I said to this guy, listen, I need to report child abuse in St Ninian's, and the guy laughed at my face, he laughed at me, he said, we've had dozens of guys like you come forward saying this, you won't get anywhere and put the phone down. No way. Yeah. Seriously? Yeah. Wow. I, 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 I can tell you the how, guy's name. It was DC Buckin. And, and, and how long ago is that? How, how long ago was that? 1998. 25 years ago. Thankfully, it uh, might not be a perfect place we live in now with how we deal with the victims of abuse, but I'd like to think it's a bit better than that today. Yeah, yeah exactly. Something just snapped. I thought, what? You think? And that was it. That was my life change. I thought, right, that, no, no, that's what made me become a campaigner. That's what made me say, right, I've got to do, I've got to do the right thing here. And the only way I can do that is by sharing my story. Now, before we move on to the campaigning part of your life, I just want to talk more about this transition to Christianity because it intrigues me. Right? I'm not saying I'm not a Christian. I'm not an atheist. Right? I believe there's something. I've just not got the whole puzzle right in my head yet. Okay. So when I talk to people that have got 100% unashamed, unquestionable faith, I actually have a lot of respect for that. And it intrigues me how they got there, right? So something sparked that in you that particular day when you decided, I'm going to pray. Do you think it was you were just at the end of your tether and thought, do you know what? See, that's God thing. It might be true, it might not be true, but I tell you what, I've not got anything else to reach out for. I'll just get a go and see what happens. Is that what made you do what you've done and just actually pray, or was there something else that led up to that moment? God God reaches out to everybody in all okay. states of their life. The, 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 biggest, the, the biggest shame is that those people that have got lots don't, don't want to listen. They think mm -hmm. they've got the, what, what they need. When, you're, when you've got nothing in your life, absolutely nothing. When I've been told that I'm going to be here for a long time in the hospital uh, and I'm going to be damaged and this and that, yeah, I was at my lowest. And that's when I prayed and God answered my prayers. Mm -hmm. uh, and ever, ever since then, my, my life has completely changed, certainly health-wise anyway, not, not maybe not mentally, but physically. And, and um, I, I've, I've now got this great, great gift of, of my story which is what drives me on. And, and every single morning, as I said before, I wake up and I, and I just thank God that I'm alive. I thank mm -hmm. God that I'm in a bed. I thank God that I'm not relying on drugs and I haven't been stabbed and I'm not in the, out in the, in the streets. You know, I like going out in the streets now and sleeping rough, knowing that I've got a bed to go back to. And, and do, I, sorry, I do, do, you, do you still do that then? You still go out and oh, all the time. sleep? All the, wow. all, all the time. Oh, I, for what reason? What I, reason? Uh, to, to be thankful for everything I've got, but also to help other people. I've, um, okay. I've, I spent. If, if you're talking about when we, we start talking about after Alice died in the campaign section, what what I've done many many times is I'll 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 send my testimony to maybe it can be I've done it from Bournemouth right up to Edinburgh. I'll contact street pastors or um, homeless groups, and I'll ask them, and I'll say, "Would you mind if I come out with you? Can I come out with you tonight or fix mm -hmm. a date?" And and I'll go and and if it's Bournemouth because you know Bournemouth is a very dangerous place with the, with the docks and things like that and Portsmouth as well, and you you, you get a different breed of um, street street workers and and uh, sorry um, outreach workers, um, you, you know that's more involved with the police and, and things like that as opposed to sort of a, an inner city town. But 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 yeah, I would I would contact and say, listen, I'm coming down for the weekend. I said I'm ex homeless. I'm I'm a, I'm a Christian. Uh, and I'm interested in pastoral work, which I did up in Inverness when I was at the college. And um, yeah, yeah, oh, we, we, we'd love, we've heard your story. It's an amazing story. Come, So I would go down uh, early in the morning, I'd sleep the day, and then I'd go at night time. I've done that in various, various, it's over a dozen cities and towns. Wow. wow. And, and look at the different different uh, cultures, the different, different way they treat people. Um, yeah, and shared my experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. So see, in the whole time since that day forward where you had your experience of uh, being reborn, 
Has there ever been a single moment where you've doubted your face? Uh, no, no, you don't. I don't doubt my faith. I, 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 I remind myself that I've got to keep in faith because if something happens, it's my fault. As I said, God gives you the tools. God gives you the direction. Um, it's all there in the Bible. And, it, and, it, and if you go off track, but again, you've got to learn. You, you've got to understand that life's a learning process. And, 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 and the thing I always say as well, Craig, is that, you, you know, you have to understand if you're carrying a lot of anger about with you, if you're, if you're unable, to, if you haven't learned how to forgive the people that did all the bad things to you, you know, these, these, these kind of baggages will only weigh you down. And, and I learned very quickly that I had to learn. Because here's the thing, when, and I know I'm going to heaven, I don't want to be carrying all this baggage with me of all these people that have done these bad things to me. I want to go up and spend eternity with my life. I want to be playing table tennis with my wee boy or girl, you know. I want to be sitting in a, in, in a garden uh, under an apple tree picking apples with my mum. That's what I'm looking forward to. But yes, I'm going to make mistakes along the way because I'm human. God didn't make us perfect. It's being prepared to understand. That's why I say to you today, uh, sorry, the la last week when we did it, I have this thing beside my bed that says, yeah. Dear God, help me to find someone today who needs your support the way that you support me. Now, that doesn't mean I've met people who they've got to pray before they open the door. They don't know what's on the other side. Well, mm -hmm. I live in faith. Faith is something different. If you live in faith, you can walk in anywhere, you know? Even through these turbulent times I've had where I, I, these accusations are in, they put me in prison, I knew I was being tested. I knew that this is all, all for a reason, for God's purpose. And the level of faith you have now, today, was that almost instantaneous at that moment when you were reborn? Or did that grow? Did your faith grow? Your faith's always there. Sometimes I go to bed at night time, Craig, and this is no lie. It happened to me when I was in Brazil. This is when it started, where I would go to my bed at night and, and I could feel this anointing. And I feel like God's filling me up with, with, with his anointing. That's his faith and his belief and his love. And, and sometimes I have to get up during the night and say, right, that's enough. Okay, yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, Lord. And then I know that, that I'm preparing myself for, for whatever happens tomorrow. Whatever this life throws at us, if we live in faith, we can handle anything. And, and I firmly believe in that. Again, I know that the trauma I carry from my life, that the I, I am going to walk into situations that I'm, I'm you know, everybody sees, saying to me, oh, Dave, you're so naive. And yeah, I'm, like, I'm naive, naive of this world because I've, I didn't grow up in this world. I was locked away all my childhood, you know, and then I lived in the... the, the underneath it in the, in, the, in, the, in the dark world the homeless world you know and it wasn't until then after Alice when I when I finally started like, trying to find jobs trying to fit in that's when I found out where the real nastiness is in this world you know when, when you try and make something of yourself you, you always find people who want to knock you down you know yeah, that yourself yeah. Craig yeah? Yeah, Amen. yeah 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 I've seen that I've seen that I've been Yep. I've been witness to that a few times, to be honest. I think most of us. And, and I have to say it, Craig. I have to say it. I mean, and and I don't care. It has to be said. There's nobody worse than the Scottish. We just mm. don't like seeing other people seeing seeing us getting on. It's true. Yeah, it seems to be a trait of ours that we. It, you know, every, every everybody's all right on the same level, but if they feel that you know, and it doesn't yeah. have. It's not monetary or or always monetary or success yeah. or whatever it could be a bit yeah. of exposure yeah. it could be anything yeah. and people just want to ground you yeah. um and, I, and yeah. I think as a society if we stopped that and we all became high aimers and wanted everybody I mean, to be high aimers then you know we'd probably how many, times, place. how many times did god throw in a revival in scotland up in the orkneys like all the times, God, like there's been a revival up in the Highlands where God's reaching out to the country and people noticed for about a week and then it went back to their old ways. God mm. loves Scotland. Scotland is one of God's favourite countries. He, he bred this people who are full of so much love and giving and such a powerful nation of, um, of, of culture and everything. But we, we've just turned our backs on that for this own political and personal agenda that's just getting us nowhere. Yeah. So how do you square, and again, I'm no having a pop at your faith, I, I totally respect your faith, and I'm quite um, 
I say jealous of it. That's not the right word to use, but I understand it, you know, and it's important to you. But and 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 that's the reason I, I need to ask you this next question. It's not to knock your faith, but how do you cope with the thought then? God is a real thing. Jesus Christ is a real thing. Why did what happened to you happen to you then? And because you it never wasn't questioned. God. It, was, it was man that did it. We mean the abuse. Yeah, yeah. That was men that men dressed in uh, devils dressed in in dressed as priests. Yeah, but forgetting for a minute they were portrayed to be religious men, right? Just the fact that the abuse happened and you had the horrific um to deal with the sixteen um week um part of your life with Alice. Do you never at any point say, Why did you do that? Because because God tests us. God is an obstinate, a powerful God. As I say, he gives us the tools to cope with things. It's how we deal with the issues that this world throws at us. Mm -hmm. uh, and the rewards are going to be when we get to heaven. Yeah, I'll only ask. I mean, I've got cousins, there's, there's, there's uh, a number of them who are brought up as Roman Catholics and you know, were full of faith. And one of them lost a daughter in early primary school age, five or six from memory. I was only young at the time and it unfortunately happened. And he lost his faith at that moment because his thoughts then, and some of his brother's thoughts also became, well, why would you allow this to happen? So you 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 know you went through similar tests um, of your humanity as they had at that time, and you managed to accept that a lot easier than some. Now I don't know where their beliefs are now because we're talking about stuff from years ago. They might refound their faith. I don't know. But they questioned it at that time, and um, I can understand that. I sort of get that. But did you, have you never questioned that? That you know, if God is all loving, why did why did I have to suffer? Do you feel that that Again, just at, had to be? So, so, so going to the the two worlds of Dave Sharp. When Alice died, when I was, um, remember me saying, somebody's upset us. That, that somebody in yeah. the, the, in the gods. Or the devils, you know, whether it's, you know, centuries and centuries and, and, and millenniums, whatever ago, I honestly believed that our family had, had done something wrong in a previous life. Mm. And now we were being punished. So I'd been in that darkest of sides, really, yeah. really despair from all the things that had happened. To now be put in, in the hands of God and to God to take me into his arms and say, here, I'm going to guide you a way out. I'm going to give you the tools uh, I, I, and I'm going to show you. You know, as I said as well, you know, all those years I was homeless, all I ever wanted, remember, remember me talking about buying my way into people's houses, you know? Yeah. And, and I used to, not just, when I, dare, I used to make friends, I did make friends and who had a wife and a son and a daughter, and Mr. and Mrs. And, and they became, they liked me and I became friends with them and they'd invite me into their house you know and, I, and I, all I ever wanted Craig all I ever wanted was a stereo and, and a television thought I'd love to have a house with a telly and a stereo because mm -hmm. I'd never had it and then all of a sudden after I became born again after I came out of the, the hospital after I had uh, turned my life around it was like a year or two years later without realising I suddenly stopped a minute and I thought hang on a minute you're indoors. You've got a flat. Look at the telly. You've got. And I thought, wow, God is working on everything that I asked for and mm -hmm. everything I need. He's working behind the scenes. And all I need to do is live in faith, stay out of trouble, and be as good a person as I can. Mm -hmm. And it's that simple. And yeah, you're going to come across brick walls and you're going to come across evil and nasty people. And you're going to come pe across people that are going to let you down. All these things are going to happen, but it's how you get back up again. And it's how so, you deal with them. How soon was it from you being a born again Christian to the campaigning starting? What's that a time scale was, 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 oh, was in there, Dave? Oh, oh, almost immediately, because I had this burning, burning desire to tell my story. Mm -hmm. This thing had happened to me. Hey, listen. A month ago, or last year, I was on the streets. I was fixing up amphetamines and 
uh, uh, the amps and I was on every drug under the sun and I was drinking a bottle of vodka every day. Now I'm clean. I don't, I've got no illnesses. My ulcers have gone. My asthma's gone. Something, something amazing's happened. And I wanted to tell everybody, and I say I went, I, I went to college. I went to tertiary college. I had to get an education, so I went to tertiary college. And then um, at least two, sometimes three times a week, I would. I liked, I, I used to, I told you about like sleeping out. I like mm. going homeless. What I would do is I would find somewhere in like Cambridge or Oxford or rugby, somewhere, and I'd find these places where they do uh, a 10 week course, evening course on psychology, or it might be like REBT, Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy. So I'd apply. <clears throat> and nowadays it would cost maybe a tenner for, for the 10 sessions. So I'd go there and I'd take my, my rucksack with a sleeping bag in it. So I'd find out where it was. Usually it was nine times out of ten it would be on, in, in the grounds of a hospital or a, a college or something. But I'd find out where it was and I'd look about and I'd find somewhere where I could sleep that night because the courses were normally from sort of nine, seven till ten or seven till nine or something. So I couldn't get the bus away back. So I'd find it and I'd go in and, and I'd do the 10 weeks course. And I'd be on this course with me. I'd always had long hair and a denim jacket and denims. But next to me would all be like trainee nurses and doctors and psychologists. Uh -huh. And very, 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 very quickly, the person doing the course would suddenly realize, because I would speak, as soon as I started speaking and talking about myself, they go, but oh, Dave, do, do you mind if we re use you as an example? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So I became the guinea pig. I became the the, the model, the model figure. And then and and, and then the, the I mean, I can give you loads of yeah. The women would say, "I've got a friend that does a course on child abuse," or "I've got a friend that does a course on another psych, uh, psychology field." And then I started doing lots of these, and I was educating myself, Craig, at the same. But what happened was that God was speaking to me, and God was saying, "You've got to slow down." He called me Hyper Haggis. <laughs> he said, that, was my nick, that was my nickname that God gave me. Because I used to see this thing and vision in my head where God was on a white horse and he was standing on this big hill and he was sitting in the horse and I'd be running by and, he, and, he, and I said, what was that? And God was giving me the message, I'm trying to talk to you. So what he did is he spoke to my heart. He says, listen, you need to go to college. You need to learn the word of God. You need to learn the Bible. You need to learn what purpose you have in this life. So I, I applied to the um, Highland Theology College up in Dingwall. I applied for an access course for a year and I got accepted. And it was just amazing. It was just fantastic. I met all these amazing people. The guy who run it, it was uh, Dr. Gallagher, I think his name was, who was the Church of Scotland Minister for Porcel. Um, And he kept on saying, he says, this, your story is amazing. Your story is this and your story is that. And that was when I started at weekends. Because obviously I didn't know him there. I would go to Inverness at, at night time and I'd walk around the streets and I'd find homeless people and I would talk to them and share my story. And I found that when I, when I was open about child sex abuse, like the grooming process and things, oh, I, I was like that as well. And, and I, 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 I've never been able to talk about it. So I, I noticed I'd, I'd not, I wouldn't say a skill, but I had, I had a passion. I, I had something there that that, 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 that was working. So, and then I started going to Edinburgh and doing the same thing. And um, and, and that's when I got taken in a room once and they said, there's a there's a project in Brazil uh, where they're setting up a homeless centre in Brazil um, for people in Sao Paulo. And uh, we want you to be a part of it. I was like, what? I said, I've never even been on a bus. And you're going to... <laughs> <laughs> You're going to was send it, me to the other side of the... So was, this through the uh, was this through a church? Um, this was through the church, aye. And, yeah. and, and uh, I, 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 was at, I was at a church at the same time. And and, and, and they said, if you find your fare, we'll pay for everything. You, you know, you, you, you won't have to pay days. It's, it, it's like a hippie commune. It was a big, a big tent. That they, they, what they do is they get homeless people from the streets. So if it's a child... Because as you probably know already, in Brazil and Sao Paulo, there's homeless people there at the age of two and three. They just throw the children onto the streets. And, and we've seen this. I witnessed all this. And um, so, and what they do is, they, through the social services, they, they reunite the kids with their fathers and mothers. 
and if it's the mothers who are addicts or homeless, they, re they try and reunite them with the kids. And, and they started building these buildings in this compound and everybody chips in. So I went out there and when you're talking about how I changed my life, how I started becoming this different person, this, this is where I, I knew, even before I went to Brazil, Craig, I knew God was saying to me, uh, this is going to be special. Something very, very big is going to happen to you here. Uh, and I went, okay. Now, uh, uh, there was a, a deliverance, but we haven't got time to talk about that yet. It, it's something very, very big happened in the Amazon jungle. But the main thing that happened was that, that uh, the day I arrived, for example, that this they, they showed me to my room, um, and, and this man came up to me and says, C can you leave your shoes outside the door every night? I said, what for? Said, so that I could wash them. All right. I said, well, I said, well I've, just, I've just bought them. The brand, no, no, he said, I want to wash. And then this woman came up five minutes later and she says, can you leave your towel outside every night so that I can wash it for you? Oh, okay. And, and, and then I found out, see the guy who wanted to wash my shoes? He was a pastor. He was wow. the head man. And he wants to do that for me. Yeah, incredible. So I was giving my testimony in this church and, and they, they took us to see the Falvalas, the, the, the real poor places, right? Yeah, yeah. Where there's no electricity, no water. And they, they took us to see this woman. And it was like, dare I say it, it's like Gaza now, you know? Mm -hmm. I know, I just know there was no electricity, no water, no roof. She had, she had no underwear, she had no socks. She just had the dress she was wearing. There was a little pot in the corner on a little piece of concrete fire. That was where she lived. And then the next day I was giving my testimony in, in a church. And I didn't speak Portuguese there. It was interpreted. But she came up afterwards and, 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 she, and she says, through the interpreter, as it's, and I get very emotional at this bit because this is what kind of really, really, when, when God was trying to teach, speak to me, this is the kind of messages he was trying to give me, Craig. And then this woman said, I, I want to come to Scotland with you and I want to be your, your, your maid, your servant. And in my head, I'm going, wow, I said, if I get a job, if I can get a job, get over time, this one will do my ironing, my cooking, wash my, di and then all of a sudden it hit me. You selfish git. You selfish git. This woman's going to give up her life for you. And all you can think about is what you're going to get out of it. That was a massive, massive message. The message was that life's about giving. Yeah, yeah. It's life's not about taking. Yeah. It's it, but, it's from that day on. From then on, I knew that it, it, yes, I'd, I'd gone. I'd a really hard life, but I, I wasn't a victim. Yeah. These people were victims. So, Dave, you you mentioned something um, quite substantial happened in the Amazon. Was that the situation you've just spoke about with us? Girl, uh, want to be your your maid for want of a better word, or was there something else that happened there? We uh, we had what, we, what what's called a deliverance, and it, and it's something I don't talk a lot about. I only talk about when I've got a Christian audience, okay. when I'm when I'm speaking in churches or I'm speaking in front of ministers, church ministers. Uh, I, I speak about this, and um, but I'll I'll give you a very very brief uh, of what happened. Um, one day we were told there was going to be an all-night prayer vigil in, in the Amazon jungle, and, and our church was going to be part of it. And I knew, I knew, knew, knew that this is what God was talking about as well, that something very, very special was going to happen um, when I got to Brazil. So we all got on a bus, we got on a coach, and uh, there was lots of guitars, and they were all singing. And I was kind of sitting on my own, very quiet, um, apprehensive, but at the same time, knowing that something very, very powerful was about to happen. And then just, just before we got off the bus, again, many people won't believe this, Craig. So I can only tell you what my experiences were. Um, and and when, you, when you hear at the end, that, that in places like Brazil, when you talk about the Christian faith, this is like a normal day to them. These kind of things happen on a daily basis, you know. But anyway, just before I got off the bus, I felt this great sense inside me like a roar and a big demon big dragon like demon was inside me and, and I fell back terrified and this this big demon was fritting out fire and it was oops sorry almost dropped my drink 
there was two big pillars and it was chained to the two pillars like like Samson and um, it was roaring at me and and I went to get off the bus and I kind of fell uh, and this Pastor Eduardo, one of my mates, came over he said, it's okay, it's okay, we've got you and, and this old woman came over, I remember, she says, uh, I'll take you, it's okay, um, you're fine and it's as if they knew, they knew what was happening and then at the same time, I had all these bagpipes and these bagpipes were getting louder inside me so, so we started walking and we walked and we walked and we walked and all the way through the jungle, you could hear all these different groups of churches singing, wailing, praying all over the place, hundreds of them. And we came to this little spot that was our spot. My mate, Bruce, Scots guy from um, Pumperton, Pumperton, near, near Stirling. Yeah. Around that Pumperton. He was there and Bruce, Bruce could speak good Portuguese, as I say, but I couldn't. And... Um, and everybody got in a circle and it was right when they start praying. So everybody got on their knees and everybody was, there was a lot of screaming and shouting. And all of a sudden I had this great big war inside me, this big battle with this demon who was just, I felt on fire. I felt, I, I was rolling about and, and I couldn't understand what was happening. And, and, and all around us, there's just, just this noise, deafening noise of people screaming and praying. And then one of the pastors came over to me and, and to Bruce and he opened his hand and he had a leaf and the leaf went gold colour. And I'm, I'm like, Bruce, what's going on here, mate? What's happening here? And the pastor said, eh, God is here. God is present. And we were like, wow, this is incredible. So I'm, I, And then I've gone back down, started praying again. And then another pastor came over. And he said, open your eyes, look at the floor. And I looked at the floor and it was like a disco, the disco lights all over the floor. And it was like, this is just incredible. So then what happened was we got up and this pastor got all the women in a circle. So all the women were in a circle and he went round and he shut their eyes. I remember that. And then he says to us, come over to me and a few other people where we were, he says, observe, observe, watch. And then he went over, and in the middle of a circle, he's pointing to a woman, and that woman fell. And I'm like, what on earth is going on here? Now, this time, I've got this big, massive battle inside me. Huge battle going on. And then when he stopped that, he walked around the circle, the whole circle, and then he got to me and he went, Dave, how are you feeling? In Portuguese. Bruce, and I said, what? Well, I'm not feeling good. I've got something, something's happening and I'm really, really scared. And then all of a sudden, everybody, everybody started putting around me and putting their hands around me. And everybody was praying and shouting and screaming. And I'm standing there and, and I'm, I'm on fire. And then all of a sudden, just like this massive, massive, massive gust of wind just came into my body and it went And it was gone. And then I fell to the floor. And as I was lying on the floor, Bruce told me later, I was down for maybe between 45 minutes and an hour, certainly over half an hour anyway. And when I was on the, the, the floor, Craig, what I saw was that the whole of the Bible from start to finish, the whole Genesis, right? I, I seen all the characters. I just went on this journey. Uh, even now, when I, and I go to certain sections in my Bible and, 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 I, and I picture this person, I go, He's the guy with the broken buckle on his shoe, uh, you know, and, and Jonah, oh, everything. Oh, I've seen everything in the Bible. And then at the very end, there's this whiteness that you can't describe. It's impossible to describe. This is heaven. And it, it's a whiteness that it, it's everything you want to be. You can't put into words everything you want. You know, you, 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 you can name a few things, but you can't name everything you want. And this is what heaven is. It's everything you want. So there's no colour, it's a whiteness, but you can't. So anyway, I went back into the, 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 it was all finished, we're walking back, and I didn't say a word to anybody, I couldn't speak, I was just numb. And I went back to the, the, the camp, and they put me in bed, and that's when this happened, when I told you about the anointing. Oh, yeah. And I was lying in my bed for two days, and all, all I felt was just this holy anointing of God filling, and it was like, all my past was, was being released. Everything was being released and it was being replaced by kindness, love, just just everything that's nice about me that I'd never felt before. 
And are you and, talking? And people, are, you, are you talking about these two days where you lay in your bed? That, that that's what was uh, going on. Okay. Yeah, two days. But these people kept on coming in, and they wouldn't speak. But they just gave me big jugs of water and maybe a sandwich and stuff. And then and then they disappeared. And I'm saying, these cats know what this is. These 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 cats deal with this every day. This is. And I found it later on, and and said that. But even before, I thought, what, what's going on over there? Now I understood. And and these these people do this on a daily basis. So, so what do you what do you believe has actually happened to you in the jungle from you know the sort of late stages of being on that bus and getting these feelings? What what do you th it's, it's think? It's it's called a deliverance. Okay. It's called, what, what it's called is a that deliverance. For someone I, I don't understand. What what is a deliverance? Somebody somebody's possessed. So do you feel you had been possessed in your life up to that point, or was that something yeah. that possessed you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Everything I told you earlier on, now yeah, it's yeah. all making sense. Now it's all now it's all so, coming out in the open. How far from the point of you praying for the first time to being in Brazil? What sort of time scale is, is, is that? Two years. Wow. No, no. Yeah, yeah, two, two and a half years, something like that. Because I was a year in, in tertiary college. And then I was at my second year now, I was at, I was at um, Dingwall in Theology College, Highland Theology, Highland Theology College in Dingwall um, mm. when this happened. You, you say yeah. that this is a, a common thing for that part of the world. Is that because there's more faith there? It's just people, people, people with nothing cry out more, okay. and when you cry out more, God answers. And and when you when you trust in God and you when you live in faith, you find that materialistic things don't matter. Nothing matters so, except for the love. Do you think you had to be in Brazil in the rainforest in Amazon for this to happen? Absolutely. Right? And why even as I said happen? to you before, even before why? I went, I was saying to people, and God was saying to me, as, and I was saying to people in the church, I said, something big's going to happen here. Something very, very big's mm -hmm. going to happen. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was. Uh, it's it's just just the most amazing, amazing thing. Again, it's just sort of um, part of this amazing story. It's uh, it's it's really really hard to believe, mm -hmm. you know. And some something else that you mentioned to me off air was two thousand and ten. When the Pope visited, see before uh -huh. I move on to that, actually, what what church are you a member of? I was in the uh, Assemblies of God. And what is that? What does Char that mean? Charismatic. I don't. Char I don't understand that. Char well, you got Catholic, Protestant, you got Charismatic. So it's um, yeah, it's just a Christian, Christian, okay. just a Christian church. Yeah. And is it, is it non? Is it non non denominal? I think it is. I think it is. You would call it non denominal. Yeah. And is that a church that is sort of specifically for people who are born again, or is that sort of normal yeah. family church? Yeah, just a clappy, clappy, happy church. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So you come back from Brazil, and then you, you'd mentioned to me previously about the Pope visiting in 2010. What happened yeah. to you in your head at that point? Well, by that point, I'd been campaigning now for 10 years, but mostly in England. Mm -hmm. Because nothing, nothing was happening in Scotland. There was no movement. And as I said to you earlier on, or I think I said to you the last time, when you would go down to London, down to the uh, House of Parliament, a lot of Scottish people started gathering. That that started happening a lot. But then, as I say, when 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 the um, when the when the Pope came to Scotland and Ireland, and uh, he refused to apologise to the to the to the survivors in Scotland, and he didn't do it till he was at the due restriction up in the air in his plane. Something that was when a new that was a whole new time. That was when something happened, a fire lit in survivors of historical child abuse in Scotland at that moment. Uh, that was the moment when I decided to contact the police, I uh, contacted the Christian brothers, I contacted the, the 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 Catholic Church, and I contacted the Scottish government, and I said to them all, I said, "Listen, I'm getting justice. I'm coming. I'm coming for everybody. I want my voice heard. Uh, I know a lot of other people who have gone through the same as me." And and that's when it started kicking off. So from from oh. then on, from then on, I'm start meeting other survivors. Uh, and then I started 2011. I met the Christian brothers, um, and I remember them saying to me, "What do you want?" I said, "I want my life back. I, I can, you, you stole my childhood. You stole my heart. I want it back. I want justice, and I want you to come out and and make sure this doesn't happen to anybody else." So what was the significance? Of the Pope, did he deliver his apology in an airplane somewhere? 
in an aeroplane, yeah. yeah. When he Apparently. was flying home from his visit to Scotland. He'd visited right. Ireland and Scotland. So, okay. Now, this was the Susan Boyle gig. Why did he not do that when he because was on the, the forum? And why is it important that he done it in the air? With it? You said jurisdiction. I'm kind of... What was the significance of that and the importance of it, Dave? Because he knew, as they know, as they know today, nothing's changed. That uh, if you open one door, there's going to be thousands of people coming forward, and and Scotland's not going to be able to cope with the amount of people that that suffered in these institutions over decades. You know. Okay. It's, yeah, again, um, that's, so again, the, the fact that he said that in an aeroplane, so he's, he has apologised. Yeah. Yeah, but if he'd have done it on Scottish soil, yeah, then we would have reason to come forward and, and claim or seek justice, you know, uh, and, and, but, and the truth be known, most people were looking for reconciliation, but, yeah. but that didn't happen either. Now, if he if he had went home the next day, opened the doors at that balcony um, in the Vatican and pronounced an apology to the Scottish and the Irish um, survivors at that point, what difference does that make? I'm, I, I'm struggling. I don't understand what the significance of whether he said it on Scottish soil and an aeroplane going back to the Vatican or for the balcony in the Vatican. Why does it matter where he says it for you as a as a survivor to have any sort of claim against the Roman Catholic Church? Because amongst the thousands and thousands of people who turned up at Bella Houston Park on that day mm -hmm. were thousands and thousands of survivors. And the, oh, opportunity right, okay. was, the opportunity was there to stand up in front of everybody and open his arms and say, uh, please forgive us. We apologise. So wasn't for any, yeah, there wasn't any legal um, ramifications to well, there was as well. apology. There, there obviously was as well, you know, but um, the, the, the legal side changes that much, Craig, you know. It's, um, and you know, they, the, they, other th they, the other thing I just find peculiar that you'll maybe be able to uh, answer, why do it in an aeroplane? Why not just Why, wait till you're home? Why did he do it physically in an aeroplane? Was there any um, relevance to that? Is that significant in any way? Financial. In terms of uh, what? And, and, and also the reputation of the church within the Catholic community. You know, it's um, mo most, of, most of the church's forgiveness statements and ch statements on child abuse come from behind closed doors. You know, you, you very, 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 until years later, um, Cardinal, Cardinal um, Paglicari, he, he openly, he met me, this is a few years later, but you very, very seldom get any leaders of the church. Most of the statements come from behind closed doors, usually the Vatican, you know. So whether how, in... how, how did he deliver this apology? Was it, did he have people from the press around him or did he write a statement when he well, was on the plane? How did he actually From what I it remember, up? he was on the plane, and he got he got he got asked the question by one of the reporters, and he said, "Yes, I apologise to the children of Scotland." That's my memory of it. Yeah. But, um, why didn't he do it in front of the survivors? Why didn't he do it at Bella Houston Park when mm -hmm. there was loads of survivors standing outside, campaigning? Oh, were they? I can't remember. That. Well, there was a, there was survivors. I wasn't there. I'd be lying if I said I was, but I know there was survivors there. And yeah, there was definitely a lot a lot of survivors there. And uh, but by then you've got to remember as well, Scotland being Scotland, and I'm sure the Pope was well aware of it, that, that the whole the Catholic community has been brainwashed and silenced. You know, it it, it 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 would be enormous shock to stand up, admit that in front of the same as when I eventually stood outside St Andrew's Cathedral in 2017, chanting across for 12 days, people were coming out and saying, This church is, shouldn't be treating you like this. This church should be willing to work with the survivors. Not making platitudes behind closed doors, small statements, and not following up. You know, mm -hmm. it never happens. I think, I think the, I think we were talking about child abuse. I run a kids' football club, and I'm ultimately responsible for the well-being because of the position I have in the club of about two hundred children, and that's quite a responsibility, and I take it very, very serious that. I cannot stop paedophiles from existing. I cannot I cannot stop paedophiles from being attracted to any organisation that gives them access to children. However, I must do everything in my power 
to try and protect the 200 children within my care as much as I possibly can. And I'm quite prepared to accept that doing as much as I possibly can still, unfortunately, does not guarantee the safety of these children because paedophiles, by the, 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 uh, the nature of their needs and, des and horrific desires, does drive them to be good liars, to be controlling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, and then because I'm in the west of Scotland, what I'm about to say next will be treated in a different way because the society in the west of Scotland, and it should, but it is factual that every organisation that has and gives people access to children could potentially be a gateway for paedophiles to um, and their desires. But it is also factual that unfortunately a massive percentage of those abused do come at the hands of the Roman Catholic Church. That is not fantasy, that is not bigoted, that is fact. And I often ask myself why. And I think, again, it's not being sectarian. Um, I believe that the way the Catholic Church was, even when I was a child, it was more powerful, they dealt with fear, you know, you're held in damnation, you're going to purgatory. And that, and that probably made the Roman Catholic face more sub subversive to those above them. And, and I don't mean God, I mean the people above them, the people um, in their church. And unfortunately, that led to, I, I'm going to make a statement that I'm, I'm quite sure you'll be able to back up, that even some children who were abused within the Catholic Church, and I think you told me a story off here that we'll come to about your friend, when they went to even their parents who were brought up and indoctrinated into the Catholic faith and pleaded with people to listen to them, they were told to be quiet because that's potentially not the adult's problem. It's the way they were brought up, that you were not to question a priest, you were not to question the church, you were not to question the Vatican. And if anybody was going to potentially put anything bad onto either of those things, then they should be quietened. And I, and, I, and I think that is why the Catholic Church has probably got a far higher percentage of uh, abused children under its care than most other organisations. And again, I need to stress, I am not saying child abuse is only an issue in the west of Scotland or anywhere else in Scotland with the Catholic Church, because it's not, that's not true. Every single area where people were given... Um, contact with children was open to being infested by paedophiles. You know, that could be BBs, that could be fo kids' football clubs, that could be swimming clubs. But it is undeniable that there was a massive, massive, unusually high percentage of people that it was, it was at the hands of the Catholic Church. And that's not bigoted. And is that your understanding as somebody that's got far more experience with child abuse than me? But what you got to do is put that into context over the last 50 years okay. and how many we're actually talking about. You know, again, I've said this before, I'm sorry for repeating myself, I said last week, Lady Smith, the chair of the Child Abuse Inquiry, said herself that for 50 years, the people of Scotland turned their back on this. You know, and, and, and I said how, because of the reason you just said, well, we were being raped and abused, our children, uh, sorry, our families and our communities were being threatened into silence. Now, you, you, if you take all that, we, we, we know 90% of the, uh, uh, those who were abused in care were abused by the Catholic Church. And, and again, if we talk in financial terms, for example, we were talking about this back in 2010, 11 and 12, saying things like, if all the survivors of in-care abuse were to come forward, it would cost in excess of £350 million. Well, if you fast forward 10 years to now, can you imagine how much it is now? You know, we're talking about over £750 million, which would not only have an impact on the economy, as we said, but also the social services, the police, everything. Everything. Now, a very famous Catholic whistleblower came out and said, a few years ago now, he said, Scotland is one of the few countries left in the world where the, where the, the, the Catholic Church is more powerful than the government, because 
they're not going to pay it, and Scotland can't afford it. So they have to work together. Now, when you start looking at the child abuse inquiry and seeing the cover-ups, it all starts to make sense. But even worse, when you start to look at, well, you probably never even heard about it, the Scottish Child Abuse Redress Scheme, which started in 2019, where the Scottish government spoke about in 2013, 14, 15, they said every single child who was in care will get £10,000. Now, since 2019, not one single penny has been spent on raising awareness. If you don't live in Glasgow or Edinburgh, you won't even know it exists. So, this is what we're, we're now sorry, calling but, this, Craig. We're now calling this financial genocide. Because sorry, John Sweeney, Andy, so is this, is this available to any child that's been in care? Any child who is in the care system in Scotland over the last 50 years will get a minimum of £10,000. Now, it goes up to 100 depending. It goes up to 100 depending on the level of abuse you suffered. Now, the level of abuse you suffered, you have to prove that. You have to somehow okay. find your records, which is impossible. Yeah. So, so many people are getting... It, it's a disaster. It's So many people... I've known people who have been off drugs for years that have suddenly gone back on drugs because it's safer than going through, having to go through what the Scottish government is putting these people through. But if they it's didn't have any... If they, didn't have, uh, if they weren't affected by any abuse, they still get £10,000. If you're in the care system, yeah. yeah. Regardless and... of if you had abuse or not. Sorry? So regardless if you were abused or not, there is a fund well, available. In, in the care wow. system. So what, what, what happened was... Why was, was that money was... given to people that had no um Well, what abuse? happened was the Scottish, the Scottish government put out a call to all the institutions, right? It might be John Bosco, it might be uh, approved school, whatever it is. Uh, and obviously the, the Catholic Church, the, 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 the Scottish government put a, a call out to all the institutions. There's, there's hundred odd, more than more than yeah. hundred, right? And he said, "You must, you, you're obliged to contribute." Now, what he said then was, "In full view of everybody, if they can't pay it, we will." So, what does wow. all the homes do? You can't afford it. Plead bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> Aye, so they don't exist anymore. So the, the Scottish government now has got this exposure to, I don't know how many, I don't know how many kids from the care system in the last 50 years, but I've got to think it's tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. Hundreds yeah. of, this is what we're saying. I, 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 if you go on my Twitter, I did a thing last year. My, my, head, my head can't comprehend how much exposure they're open to then. Well, let me show you something. Let me share something with you now. This is really, really important. There was a thing done two years ago where, I'll, I'll try and scroll down and show you this. There was a thing done two years ago, Craig, where someone got a hold of um, the amount of children that had been abused by the Catholic Church in each country. And, okay. uh, and, and it, it was, I mean, America was a million one hundred. France was 600,000. Um, it goes down that Germany was half a million. This list is it, it's, it's, it's incredible. It made me cry for two days. And, and, and it said uh, UK was broken down, Scotland was 110,000. And this is just what they know. Now, that, mean, this, is only, this is only through the Catholic Church as well. There will be other people abused. Yeah. Yeah. This is just the yeah. Catholic Church. With, 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 your, with your knowledge, what, what sort of percentage would you guess? I mean, I imagine the figures don't exist, so it's just a guess and a gut feeling. But what percentage of abused children do you think were at the hands of the Roman Catholic Church? And this isn't to have a pop at Roman Catholic Church. This is just to try and give me some scope on the amount of people were, were considered and were abused in total. Well, it's easier, it's easier to put it this way, that, that the stats that have never changed over the last 50 years, that, that between 60 and 75% of those who are or were in addiction or homeless or in prison were abused as, sexually abused as children, and 90% of them were in the care system. Now, the only thing that's changed is over the last 10 years, the average age of those that are dying is getting younger and younger. Just a month ago, we had a report from Glasgow University that said 75% of Pullman and all young offenders in Scottish prisons were sexually abused as children. And 90% of them were in the care system. You can so, go anywhere and you will not find these stats anywhere because every door's been shut. These figures are real, Craig. This so is a it, real 
tragedy is that's it, going on in Scotland. Has anybody ever been able to work all these stats backwards to find a, a number of children in total that we're looking at here over maybe a 50 It, it won't year. happen in Scotland. It won't happen in Scotland. If you're a charity, this is what we say as well. Uh, it, it, I mean, this could sound childish. If I won £50 million pounds and I wanted to do, to do something about this, First of all, you would have to, in order to sort this, you'd need to take the responsibility away from the politicians, right? Because the politicians are too wrapped up in, in, in the, the, the figures. So even, even if you took the, if you, and, and the child abuse charities now, 90% of them are run by the government, so they're funded. As soon as you're funded by the government, you that's it, you can't talk. They've mm -hmm. got you. You can't mm -hmm. talk. And that's why you go on Twitter. I, I, I'm a member of over 50 child abuse campaign groups all over the world. There isn't a week goes by where I say, we say to people, Google Child Abuse Scotland or Google Child Sex Abuse Scotland. There's nothing apart from one or two of us. And people from Canada, and America, they say things like, Dave, what's going on? Why is it so silent? And this is why we're saying now, I'm making statements now, Craig, like all over the world, all over the world now, those figures I told you about a minute ago, things are changing. Priests are coming forward. Bishops are coming forward saying, no, enough's enough. Thousands of survivors are coming forward from all over the globe. Lights are coming on in every corner of the world. And the more lights that come on, people are turning to Scotland and saying, why is it still so dark in Scotland? Why are survivors so terrified to come forward? Mm -hmm. The answer is because as soon as you're, if you leave care, Straight away, you, as soon as you leave care and you mention that you were sexually abused, you're put straight on a prescribed medication. And then you're expected to just disappear off the radar. And this is the people who you turn up one year, two years, three years, four years, five years later, in and out of prison, going through the revolving doors of prison. I've just put that in my calculator, there, and I still can't believe the figure then. If there's 100,000 people been through the care system in 50 years in Scotland, Oh, no, 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 no. Listen, let's look at let's look at Nazareth House, right? Nazareth House has got four homes, right? The, the nuns, right? Yeah. yeah. So Nazareth House, Kilmarnock, Nazareth House, Glasgow, it's uh, Cardonald, Nazareth House, Edinburgh, which is last wage, and Nazareth House, Aberdeen, right? So over the last 50 years, there's between 50 and 75,000 children went through their doors. That's just those one four home. places. Wow. That's only I just that's just Nazareth House. So the Scottish uh, just, government have got ago, a liability of ten thousand pounds minimum this, to all these people. This is important. A month ago, three nuns got sentenced for abuse, but the point is, no priests have ever been sentenced. All the different cases you get in Scotland, I could name you four very high-profile court cases that went on in the last ten years, where a number of survivors came forward, and a number of men, mainly priests, were were um, named, but by the time it gets to court, in one case there was 70, 80 survivors, by the time it gets to court, there are only six. And you say to yourself, well, what happened to all them? What happened to all those people? They disappear. They disappear. We tried to look, I, I went on the streets of Scotland campaign, and I've spoke to hundreds and hundreds of people who have, 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 want to talk to the child abuse inquiry, but depending on what they know and what they tell you, you can tell if they're going to be rejected by the, the child abuse inquiry. When you understand that, Craig, then you'll understand why it was so easy to put false allegations on me and for the justice system just to throw me in prison. I never did nothing wrong. Everybody says to me, you know too much. You're too good at your job. When the child abuse inquiry started in 2017, on the very same day the child abuse started, I started my group safe. We went outside the Child Abuse Inquiry in Edinburgh. We got a piper and we handed out leaflets. The next day we stood out in Georgie Square for three days. 70 people came forward. Within one year, 18 months, we had a, the, the law firm as well. So there's the Child Abuse Charity, there's us, the survivors, and the lawyers standing on the streets of Scotland. Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dundee, Gay Pride, Walk for Suicide, all these different places. And I remember sort of 18 months in, I remember contacting one of the managers of the, of the law firm, a woman, and I said, they're just out of interest. I said, how many people have we referred to you in this short space of time? She says, well over 200. I went, wow. And I said, let me ask you a question. I said, out of those 200, how, how many were in the care system? 
Oh, she says, Dave, that's really interesting you're asking this because we, we, we're starting to notice. We, 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 we've been asking questions about that. I said, okay, let me ask you a couple of questions. How many do you know that have been in and out of prison all their adult life? How many do you know who started committing crimes when they left the care system? I know people, Craig, that, that the only person they send a Christmas card to is the lawyer because there's no family. But these lawyers are happy for them to go through the court system in, in and out, in and out, knowing, because what the, what the trick is, what they need to do is, when you come out of the care system, they put you on side medication, the, the, the object of the exercise is to get you, you have to, to, be, to be transformed from a child abuse survivor to a career criminal. And we have this production line that the justice system takes part in, where trauma is a crime. And as I say, even now to this day, we're still doing it to our children. If we did, and you've got me going now, if we had a freedom of information or some way of sorting, I could tell you six law firms off the top of my head that I know have got dozens and dozens of men. You just have to go into prison and speak to the prison officers. That's so-and-so, and, -so, and, and they, they just send so many survivors and I say, well, why, don't, why doesn't nobody go in and say to them, if you've got children of your survivors, why are, you still, why are you not referring them to charities for help? And when you talk to the survivors, they say the same thing. Oh, I gave up. So when you go in the streets of Glasgow and you say, oh, I, 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 I tried to report it 20 years ago. Nobody listened. And this is what's happening, been happening for years, Craig. Dave, I'm conscious of the, the time left in this recording, OK? Um... So I, I want to just finish up, and I think we need to do a part three, I need to be honest with you, right? But to finish this part, with your knowledge and your experience, would you be prepared to put any sort of figure on the amount of people, the amount of children you believe to have been abused in Scotland by pedophiles over that, that term? Six, six figures. Is it, uh, well over a hundred thousand, yeah. Over a sort of fifty-year period. Uh, that, sorry, that's just the Catholic Church. But if you're going to talk about um, whole, I'm 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 mainly concentrating on the institutional piece at the time. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Let, let's widen that. Yeah, it'd be yeah, near yeah. two hundred thousand. Over a fifty-year period. So that's twenty thousand over ten. No, twenty thousand over five. It's just constant, isn't it? Everybody Thousands knows somebody that's sexually abused. Everybody knows somebody. And it's making it, the, the, more, the more we ignore it, the more scope and the more anger we give for these, I don't, again, I don't like to use bad language, parasites. That, that, that to mm. me is swearing. I don't like to okay. use language like that. Okay. I, I, to me, that's a swear word. But these parasites well, are making money to these people. Yeah. And, it, and the more money they make, Thank the more opportunities they get, the, re the easier it is to silence people like me. Yeah. And folks, I think this is, we're going to need to wrap up this particular podcast just because of the time constraints, but I think it's easy talking to Dave where I thought we could cover his life story in one episode. That was impossible. I thought we could finish it off with a second one. That is equally as impossible because I know there is far more of this story through talking to Dave. So we will record at least a part three, which is incredible because that will now be about four hours of footage we've already got done. And we will do that within the next week or two. So thank you very much for tuning into this. Thank you very much for the support I've seen shown to Dave through social media when part one came out. I'm sure that will continue now that part two is out. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it, and comment below. But unless you are a paedophile, or you have covered up for paedophiles, or if you in any way stop the voices of the hundreds of thousands of victims in Scotland, have a great day. Cheerio bye now.